we're going to acknowledge it and we're going to enjoy it. A special word of thanks to so many of you who participated in a project that involved thousands of bags and boxes prepared for the hungry, as well as you who contributed to make that happen. Thank you for your generosity of time and your gifts. Think of all it means to the community around us for them to have a Thanksgiving. It's common for us, but for them, it makes it special knowing that it comes from hands that are loving and caring and generous. So thank you for that. And I just want all of you to know how grateful we are as you participated in that project. Special word of greeting to you who are guests today. Happy to have you come, and we always are pleased to see you. And come again as you're able and as often as possible. And to you who are online and come to be a part of our worship service from all around. I got an email just this morning early from a friend in Australia, and uh, he wrote it, I don't know what time it was, in the middle of the night I got it, and he said, I just loved tuning in and being a part of your worship time. So there are those all around the globe. Thank you, musicians, uh, all of you, and all of you in the congregation for your hearts of worship and, and delight. We're so glad that when it's time for us to sing, you sing. You just don't sit there going, sing it out, belch it out. I mean, belch it out, let it go. You're going to hear about plans for this holiday season from uh, uh, the, the screen today. Watch closely as, as uh, Ms. Hightower tells us about the plan that's coming. Listen closely. She has a soft voice. So the most closely. wonderful time of the year is almost here. The time when we focus our hearts on thanking God for the gift of our Savior. I'm Kristen Hightower, and on behalf of our staff, I'd like to invite you to celebrate the joy of Christmas with us here at Stonebriar. First, we have a new event this year to kick off the Christmas season together. You're invited to our very first Christmas tree lighting on Wednesday, November 29th at 5.30 p.m. We'll gather around our new 30-foot tree in the Circle Drive for carols and hot cocoa, and we'll have train rides and bounce houses for the children. You can even bring a family ornament to hang on one of the trees. There's no cost to attend. Simply sign up online so we can have enough treats for everyone. Then be sure to join us for our annual Christmas concerts of worship our traditional service will be led by our Sanctuary Choir and Orchestra on December 3rd and our Children's and Youth Choirs on December 10th. So invite a friend and come enjoy beautiful Christmas music that tells the story of Jesus, God's greatest gift to us all. You can find details on these and all of our Christmas events today at stonebriar.org slash Christmas.
you're among our veterans today or a mate of a veteran, wife or husband of a veteran, and you may be serving now, you may have served in the past, please remain standing. The rest of you may be seated. I can't speak for the, all of you, but I will tell you what I think of when I sing the national anthem. I think of those of you who have served and those who have served in years past. I give thanks for those who gave the last full measure of their devotion. On a battlefield that was dangerous, but where freedom was fought and won. I give thanks for you who've worn the uniform in places that were lonely, difficult, and often dangerous. You who had buddies with you throughout that time where you built a relationship and became a band of brothers and, and a band of sisters. And you serve because you love this country. We thank you today on this Veterans Day for wearing the uniform, standing tall, and making possible the continuation of this land of the free and home of the brave. Today, we honor you without reservation or hesitation. Thank you for serving in the United States Military Service. You may be seated. The best way that we as individuals can love our country, I think, is to love God with all of our hearts and souls and minds. First verse of this next hymn is actually a prayer. It's inviting Jesus to come, thou fount of every blessing, to in our hearts to sing thy praise. Would you stand, please, as we sing?
Some scenes in the Bible are absolutely remarkable. Regrettably, some of them have become so familiar that we fail to grasp just how remarkable the scenes are. I mean, when you stop to think about it, Saul of Tarsus was a terrorist. And the account of his salvation is the account of the conversion, not just a terrorist, but a serial terrorist. Remarkable. I would venture to guess that no one expected that to happen. No one on this earth. He was among the most feared of individuals, but not to God. It was just a matter of time before the Lord would bring him down, leave him quivering on the dirt, blind, and in need of being led by the hand into the very city he planned to terrorize. That's what we read about in Acts chapter 9. It's the conversion of a serial terrorist. Remarkable story. I don't want it to lose any of its significance through familiarity. So please listen with fresh ears to an old, old story as if hearing it for the first time. If you have your Bible on your lap, please open it to Acts chapter 9. I'll be reading the first nine verses from the New Living Translation. Please follow along as I read this. And after standing, please remain standing for prayer. May we stand together for the reading of the word of God. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest requesting letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus, on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, 
He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. May we bow together for prayer. Father, forgive us for writing off anyone who doesn't know the Savior. Remind us through this story and others that you are able to find anyone and bring anyone to his or her knees. No one is so far gone that it is impossible to reach them, for you are not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. We do not know your plan. We cannot predict your ways. So Lord, guard us from putting together a list that is useless when the sovereign Lord is involved. For you have never met your match. You have no, never known a barrier that holds you back a situation that is so far gone that you can't intervene, including what's happening right now in the land of Israel. None of that is beyond your ability to handle, take care of, resolve, and to do so in your time and in your way. We long that there be peace in that land we long for you to bring relief to the suffering, bring back the hope that was once there, give release to those who are hostages. May they be preserved from further danger and may they be brought back in health and strength. Calm the hearts of those who wait for them, whose arms ache for them. Remind us regularly, Father, to pray and to uphold them before you. Use this story today as a reminder to me, to all of us who hear it, that you are in charge. You are the God of our lives. That there is no such thing as hiding from you. All things are open and naked before your eyes. So, May we ultimately find our rest in you and freedom from worry and constantly reminded that our God is in the heavens. He does what he pleases. You remind us today as well that you own it all. Every possession we have been tempted to call our own is your possession. Every penny, every dime, every dollar that's in our pocket or our accounts, they're all yours. We would have none of them were it not for your grace. When we give to you, we give from what you have already provided for us. It's no sacrifice. It is our privilege, and we do so with great rejoicing and with energetic generosity. Use our gifts, we pray, for your greater glory and for your ultimate purposes. At this season of the year, may we realize that we're always in a state of thanksgiving. Thank you for giving to us. 
And now that we might give to others, thank you for this time of offering. We offer first ourselves and then gifts for your purpose and glory. It is in the name of your Son, Christ, our Lord. We pray and we give. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Saul had murder on his mind. May have been thinking about these days, even back when he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, being schooled in the finer points of Judaism. As he heard rumors and then finally saw evidence of those who were determined to become followers of a dead leader, whom they thought to be alive. To him, they were simply another heretical cult who had come to be known as followers of the way. Ah, oh, the way. What way? When you look at that through the eyes of the terrorist, it makes you sick. And the fact that their ranks were enlarging, enlarging, almost month after month, it seemed, someone had to do something about that. Saul became a one-man army. He'll take on that task without reservation and without hesitation. No matter where he must go or what he must do, Jerusalem could not contain him. Wherever he would get orders to go, he would take those papers and round them up, put them in chains. No cult like this deserved to continue. Every one of those followers needed to be hunted down, arrested, put in chains, brought back to Jerusalem, placed on trial, silenced, and ideally removed forever from society. That's his MO. That's his agenda. No exaggeration. He has become now fueled by religion, which is a dangerous fuel when you're on the wrong side. He's now willing to take on a city 150 miles away from Jerusalem. Whatever it takes. Sure, he'll go there. Damascus, whatever. There's no place he won't pursue. They have no idea the plans he has in mind. But believe me, they knew about Saul of Tarsus. At least the believers did. They weren't known as Christians early on. They were known as followers of the way. And that group became the, the bullseye of his target. Truly a serial terrorist. And if you knew anything about his thoughts during the day and his dreams during the night, you'd fear him too. Because he's after you. And he's after me. If that seems like an exaggeration, listen to his own words as he years later looks back and remembers his life when he was filled with hostility and hatred. Quote from Saul himself. I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus. Jesus the Nazarene, indeed, 
I did just that in Jerusalem. I caused many believers there and elsewhere to be sent to prison. I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. Say it! Say it! I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. Read it for yourself. Acts 26, 7 through 11. It's all there. And if you listen closely, you will notice that the real center of the bullseye were not the followers of the way, but the way himself, Jesus. Curse that name. He was after Jesus of Nazareth. This false Messiah that his colleagues have already put to death. The Sanhedrin had taken care of him, nailed him to a cross, got him in a grave, sealed it, gone, gone, finally gone. And now these people have the audacity to be spreading the rumor that he is alive. That's got to stop. That cannot go on. They must be silenced. And he stopped at nothing to make that happen. He is opposed to this one individual whom he claims is dead but is very much alive. and is watching his every move. How ironic it is that the one who saw himself as the, the ultimate hunter is in fact the hunted. He had no idea, no idea. All through the hunt, the hunter was being hunted by the sovereign hunter. It wasn't until Saul was on that 150-mile road to Damascus, almost at his destination, that a whole new agenda was introduced to him. And he realized the roles are reversed. He is now the target. And the sovereign hunter has found his target. I remember when my sons and I were doing a lot of hunting back years ago, it was fun to sit around a campfire and uh, talk about experiences you have when you have hunted in years past. And your boys are with you and, and you're sharing stories. I remember passing along to them one of my favorite rules. Let's agree, guys, that we will never hunt anything that if we miss our shot, hunts us. <laughs> Got it? So let's don't go after bears. Let's don't take on elephants. <laughs> let's don't think we can go after leopards. And on and on we can name the, the animals. 
Saul didn't know my rule. Saul didn't realize that is the, that's the way it works when the divine hunter is on your trail. Nor does anyone without Christ. Well, there may be passing moments in hard times when one may think, I just wonder if somebody's after me, someone I don't know. But we pass it off. It was a bad dream. But Saul can't ignore this one. Preoccupied with his uh, plan of attack, no doubt talked about it along the journey, which would take about a week in those days, traveling by cart or on horseback from Jerusalem to the ancient city of Damascus. Somewhere toward the end of that journey, something absolutely unexpected occurred. By the way, I, 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 I love moments like that. I especially like them when they happen to someone else because I've had some of my own. And you're seized with feelings you did not realize were latent within you. A light shines from somewhere brighter than a laser, most likely bright as lightning, shines all around him and the result is he lands on the dirt, a quivering mass of humanity. Suddenly, he isn't the um, standalone, watch out for me, terrorist that he has been all along. He loved that role. He loved that people cowered before him. No longer, he is flat on his back, and along with the lightning light, brightness of that light, there is a thunder-like voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His, his answer is in all sincerity, oh, who, who are you, sir? The word he uses, or at least Luke uses in translating the term, kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, translated Lord in our Bibles. Who are you, Lord? Is a word of respect. It meant like our word, sir. Who are you, sir? Who are you? He's never heard that voice before. He hears, according to his own testimony, when he stood before Agrippa years later, back in Acts 26, he also heard the Lord say to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What's a goad? Well, in the days of riding carts pulled by oxen, the one driving the cart would carry a long stake, long stick. The end of it would be sharpened to a point, and it would be used to punch the rump of the, of the oxen to get him move along, lest he become sluggish and too slow in his pace. Get along there. Let's move on. And it would irritate oxen, and they would kick back, kick high against the goads that were being punched at them. In this day, in, in, in this case, Saul doesn't realize he's holding the goad. And 
and, and he, he can't kick at it much with success. He, he can't handle it. It's hard for you to do that. In other words, uh, you're pretty helpless in this journey, in this process of my getting your attention. You know what I think when he heard persecuted? Why are you persecuting me? I do wonder if he had a flashback regarding Stephen. Remember last time we were together? The story of that great man who was stoned to death. And in the persecution, the persecutors stripped to the waist and tossed their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's Saul of Tarsus. That's this man. He'd seen persecution. He'd been a part of it. He agreed to what was being done. He didn't hold them back from the stoning. Throw them. Get rid of him. He's dangerous in Saul's eyes. One fine expositor describes the scene like this. Saul the hunter was a brutal, implacable, bloody man. His goal was nothing short of the complete extermination of the way. He was a callous, self-righteous, bigoted murderer set on a full-scale inquisition. Yet this persecutor, by the grace of God, became an apostle of Jesus Christ. I, I know. I, unfortunately, you're familiar, most of you, this, your, your lips can move with words like that. You, you know, wait a minute. I've asked you to hear with new ears. This serial terrorist is going to write the manual for our Christian doctrines. This terrorist is going to map the way of world missions and give us principles by example of what it means to go into the world and preach the gospel. This terrorist is going to be the exemplification of an evangelist par excellence. Same man whose life is being transformed right here before our eyes. This limp man lying in the dirt has no idea what he must suffer and what he will do for the cause of Christ. All of that is before him right now. He's simply confused. He can't make heads or tails of what's happening. The blinding flash, the, the voice like a, the echo of a waterfall coming down with his name in it. He must have known at that moment, I have been on the wrong journey. How disillusioning it must have felt. He has given it with full passion. His name has been called not once but twice, so there's no mistake. The voice, wherever it was coming from, knew him. 
knew where he was. He respects him by calling him sir, but he has no idea what the plan is. Now he sees his agenda for Damascus has been reversed. Now, the hunted has been found. And the sovereign hunter has succeeded. Two things Saul learned from the encounter before I go further. First, he learns that Jesus is in fact alive. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And second, he realized it wasn't followers of the way, it was the way himself that he had been chasing after and that will now stop for the rest of his life. How marvelous of God and the joy, joyful message is that he's still doing that. All around the world, including today. He's found some today. He's cornered them He's called their name, and they've come to an end of their empty journey. And they're realizing their path has been in the wrong direction. I see two lasting, timeless lessons in this story of the conversion of a terrorist. The first is to those of us who know the Lord. And if you're in that category, please hear these words and, and don't forget them. Never write off anyone. I, I know, I know, you, you, you know someone, maybe a relative, maybe a former friend, maybe a former husband or wife, it, it may be some dreadful criminal. You, you, you've said impossible. Put them at the top of the list. Throw away the list. Since the Lord is not willing that any should perish, we should not be willing to write off any name. I've known some pretty bad guys, uh, and, and so do you. I've seen some of them brought to their knees in the most remarkable way, the most remarkable way. And some in that condition, finding themselves all of a sudden Helpless when they have once been strong and capable and stable, earning a fine living and marching ahead with their own agenda, brought to an end. And I, I thanked the Lord and felt the rebuke because I had marked them off as they're too far gone. No one is too far gone. No one. No, not even the one you're thinking right now. No one. If the Lord can reach Saul of Tarsus, he can reach anyone. Anyone. The hound of heaven never loses your scent. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro over the whole earth, seeking those who will be his. 
that's not hard for omnipresence. He's all over the earth. Uh, the, 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 the second lesson I, I need to get into, because it's to you who are without Christ, you can run, but you can never escape. Never. <laughs> you, you may not want to admit it to anyone, but uh, in your hidden moments, when you're alone and no one else is around and you sneak a peek into the Bible, Choose Psalm 139 and read it slowly. It'll tell you all about yourself, how you were made, how you are known, and how you cannot escape his presence. It even says, if I take the wings of the dawn, which is the poetic, artistic way of saying, if I could travel the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, And I could get to the remotest part of the sea. Even there, even there, your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold me. Even there. Cannot escape. I remember much, when I was much younger, and we all were first reading, those of you who are older, remember reading that the Russians put up the Sputnik, Remember, some of you? Uh, the cosmonauts went around the earth and came back, and they were so proud to announce they had been into space and they did not see God. W.A. Criswell preached on that particular event the following Sunday, I was told. He made a great statement. He said, if you had stepped out of that spacesuit, you would have seen God. <laughs> he makes everything in space. He's never out of space. He's never away. He's never gone. He's never sleeping. He's never weary. He never overlooks. You can't escape. He's there. He's there, Saul. Right there. Every roll of the cartwheel after leaving Jerusalem to demand, he was right there planning the time. Right now, the light came. Right now, the voice was heard. You cannot escape. You can run. And maybe the one you love so much is now running, running, running. It's one of the favorite pastimes of the lost. We're just so proud of our stuff. <laughs> we have strange ways of promoting it. Joe Allen told me a cute story. He was in a pile of traffic and a beautiful, brand new, bright red Lamborghini came around him. Cut him off right in front of him. License plate red. <laughs> GPA 2.7. Isn't that good? <laughs> I was no valedictorian, but I got a Lamborghini and you don't, baby. So, you, 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 you're going to hide in a Lamborghini? How about a Ferrari? How about a garage full of Ferraris? What are your playthings? Your uh, portfolio? Stuff with cash? really well healed into the millions, maybe billions, I don't know. Easy to think, I got it, got it made. 
till the doc says it's stage four cancer and it's inoperable. Maybe three weeks, maybe less. Suddenly, you don't even want to look at the Lamborghinis or the Ferraris. Suddenly, you got nothing. You're like the one who wrote, one by one he took them from me, all the things I valued most, till I was empty-handed. Every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways grieving in my rags and poverty until I heard his voice inviting, lift those empty hands to me. So, so I turned my hands toward heaven and, and, and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God cannot pour his riches into hands already full. All of a sudden, all of the accolades, all of the applause from the Sanhedrin, all of the followers of Saul, meant nothing. Only the voice of God that spoke from eternity saying, you, you, you're going to go to Damascus. Interesting, he got to Damascus, but he was led by the hand, blind. We got there, was there three days blind. A guy named Ananias was told to come and tell him, the Lord has many things for you, Saul, and oh, you must suffer much for me. It's, it's all in front of you, Saul. You thought your life was spent. Oh, it hadn't even begun. What I have for you. It's over, Saul. You're mine. Welcome. Now listen carefully. Here's a new agenda. Let me say to those of you who are around the newly present converts, welcome them. Go put them on probation. Don't hold them at a distance. God's grace had brought, has brought them to the family. Welcome them in. Give them a place at the table. Thank them for coming. Pray for them. They're into a journey they never dreamed would happen. And rather than my saying they, I want to change it to you. Surely, in a gathering this size, including those online, there are multiple thousands of individuals. Many of you have never, never come to Christ. You're on your own Damascus road, different from Saul, but it's your own, your own plan, your own agenda, your own stuff. You have no idea. He is on your trail. And today is part of that journey where it's my privilege to remind you you have been found. You will run no longer. Trust him. Come. Like Saul, don't 
Don't fight it. He's calling your name. Come. Come to him. Trust him. Join me as we close our eyes and bow our heads. The sacred moment right now, very important. I've been speaking, now it's the Lord who must speak. If he's making it clear to you that you are among those who have been running and trying to escape, hear him tell you, the running is over. You've come to an end. You are mine. My son has died for you and he is available to change your life and the course of the direction you've been going starting today. You will never be the same. Here's my gift. It's called eternal life. I'll never take it back. You can never lose it. Once you receive it, receive it now. Receive it now. Father, it is such a pleasure to be in your presence, such a comfort. To know that you have preserved in your word a true story of a very mean and dangerous man who in a moment of time lost all of that and went through a brief process of change and then became your tool of hope truth and a new direction for millions of lives because he said yes to you. Thank you, Father, for hunting him down and bringing him to yourself. Now as you're in the journey of hunting others, I pray that for many that hunt will end today. They will bow before you and trust you as Lord and Master. That you might change their life as well. I ask this in the name of Christ, our Lord. Everyone said, Amen. Thank you.